evening, everyone. Um, I hope everyone uh, can hear me. Um, I'm Fabio Besti. I am the program leader of the Master in Business Design and the Master in Visual Brand Design. Welcome to everyone to Domus Academy Disrupting Patterns Talk. Uh, this is a multidisciplinary and innovation-oriented open lecture um, that deal uh, is a format that deal with various topics related to design, uh, deepen, deepening uh, them with the desire for research, contemporary processes, and future themes. Uh, today, we have the big pleasure to have with us uh, Anne Mike Egenkamp and uh, Fenemek uh, Gomer. I hope uh, yeah. that I, I didn't uh, butcher the names too much. Uh, <laughs> please yeah. forgive me if I did that. Um, they are the co-founders of Character, uh, Character Business Innovation and the co-authors of the best-selling book, uh, Boardroom Creativity, How to Design the Future of Your uh, Business. And they will be in dialogue with Elena Sisti, uh, who is an independent consultant and Domus Academy longtime collaborator and professor. So we are super happy um, to have all of you. Uh, it is extremely interesting, of course, to continue um, to explore the topics revolving around the relationship between uh, business, design, and innovation, of course, looking at the future, which is a, a core um, scope and a core goal that we have here at Domus, of course. Uh, so uh, without further ado, uh, I leave the stage to Elena Sisti, and thank you all again for your partic participation. Thank you, Fabio. Uh, thank you for the opportunity of actually meeting uh, the authors of this magnificent book and having the chance to discuss with them the content of it and more than the content of the book. The content of the book is very interesting and we go through different parts of it, their experience, their hands-on experience in trying to help entrepreneurs getting into innovation and be able to create their new future and actually change in the way things are done in a certain way. Uh, welcome to everyone who's listening. I'm very happy to be part of this uh, lecture that Domus gives, and uh, I'm very happy to be part of Domus community, actually, that it's uh, a very interesting, innovative way of thinking and applying the research in Italy, uh, in the city of Milan, uh, where innovation has been happening for a while, the design thinking is developing, and in a lot of ways, Fenik and Anne welcome both of you. Italians think we have a lot to say about creativity and creation. Uh, your book is called Boredom Creativity. And one of the sentences I like the most is the fact that uh, you started writing this book because you state very clearly that you believe it's time to get serious about creativity. And I'm going to start with you. Why do you think creativity is so central to the business development? And what do you think are the characteristics that actually identify creative minds in the world like us that is changing so fast? Well, thank you for having us here. And thank you for your first question, which is already a kind of in the heart of the topic. But I'm happy to answer, try to answer it. Now, the thing is, if, if we look at how business has developed in the last 20, 30 years, then you see there was a kind of dominant way of thinking, which is quite focused on, let's say, using the right or the left side of our brain, um, economics, risk, growth. Um, and the people who were in charge were actually really good at that. No defense. I mean, that's really what happened, and that's way, what made Europe, I think, big, and also Italy and in the Netherlands. Why we believe that creativity is important now, it's a super complex time. Uh, complex issues and wicked issues are not a very, do, do need a different process to solve them and to tackle them. And not only in business, but also for let's say for designers, for, for all kinds of people, but we focus on business people. And why is creativity needed? Because it, it demands a different mentality of people and it demands different collaboration of people. And you can say the, the, the dominant way of thinking and working, let's say strategy seeing as a kind of linear process is not working anymore. 
and to find a new way to approach you know today's challenges and you have to think of societal challenges and and you know all, all kinds of wicked issue in current society um that is not only talking about it but also find new ways to solve them and find new ways to tackle them and the reason why we believe creativity is an important thing, because creativity was never linked to, let's say, business mind and was never linked to strategy. I mean, both Fenemik and I are designers from background, uh, graphic design and industrial design. So that way of thinking and doing, we totally see that you can apply this in how you, how you tackle these complex matters. And, and we figured out that it helped, that it helped our clients in saying, you know what, designers do not have a kind of linear left way, left brain way of thinking, but are far more, you know, starting and discovering like what is the best way to do things and far more iterative processes instead of a linear process in doing so. Creativity demands a different mentality and a different start and mindset to start processes like this. So that's to start with, to kick it off. Thanks, Anne. I wanted to sort of go to the core of your book because I thought it was very interesting to start with one of the concepts that you go on and on. And obviously, in order to give you a bit of space now, in order to understand, because one of the interesting parts of the book is why did you write the book? So Fenemik, would you write, would it be possible to tell you a bit of your story? How do you, um, decided to write this book and choose to publish it in terms of your meeting with Annemiek and uh, uh, a bit of your introduction. I'll go back a little bit further because I grew up very much in an uh, entrepreneurial family and uh, so it's a very tech business oriented family and I was the youngest daughter and I started to study design but on the other hand I'm not a designer I'm more a creative thinker than a designer and then a maker uh, and I, I found, and I was very happy to find the Domus Academy. Uh, so I did my master's at the Domus Academy uh, a long time ago. Uh, and for me, it became clear then, and you know, it was not for nothing that we went to Italy at the time, because of course, Milan was the center. I was studying product design, and that was the center of creativity and product design. But I was very happy to find a design management degree at, uh, at uh, Domus, because that is, of course, beyond product it's really about how to apply it to business and work with entrepreneurs but honestly at that time it was still very much a silo you had the business world they were working with the McKinsey's on their business strategy and then you maybe had entrepreneurial types like the uh, Alessis of the world that would maybe work with designers but they wouldn't mix mm. I think when, when and in the Netherlands, we weren't so advanced at that moment. Uh, business people were not talking to creative people. Even entrepreneurs were not talking to creative people. So going back to the Netherlands and working as a strategy consultant, I realized these silos and I started to apply some of these creative principles uh, and moving forward, because I'm not going to take you through my whole career, but at a certain point, uh, I worked as a consultant for Annemiek, who was then the chair of the Design Academy, Eindhoven. And we really started talking then and afterwards about there is such potential in creativity and creative intelligence, and what a waste that it's limited so often only to the creative world. How can we bring this strength and this potential to our other world? So this book is really geared towards people in a way, a lot of our clients who are more from a, let's say, MBA type background, who are not familiar with these concepts. And so we're trying to, to span two different worlds and bring the power of creativity, if you like, to this business world, which is even more necessary because of the complexity, as Anamik said, but also because life cycles of businesses are becoming shorter. So when strategy used to be more about optimizing, now we need to reinvent ourselves more often because we're more often at the end of the life cycle. And that takes another approach. For that, you really need to three, you know, think of innovation as a design challenge. So I think the timing is, uh, is much better now than it was when I first, uh, <laughs> first did the Thomas Academy. And you see that there is many more, there's a lot of attention for design thinking. There is a business design a master's now at Doma. So I think the world is starting to become more ready for it. That's another uh, aspect. And to, to add, 
uh, to add something because that's also funny to, to share with people. Um, actually, we started the book because a lot of people were constantly asking us, but what are you exactly doing? And how, what is your offer and what is your service in helping us out, you know, in creating a new strategy of, you know, thinking of the future. And then we looked at each other like, but hold on, maybe we should write a book. Maybe it's also for ourselves, you know, to build a structure and a methodology and coming up with a framework, what really helped people. And so it helped us help in getting a very clear focus in why are we doing this and why are we believing in this? But also on the other hand, the book is very useful and successful in like you were saying, uh, Elena, to help you to understand like, ah, this is, this is how it could work. And you're taking me to one of the things that I sort of reading your book, I, I am one of those ones that come from a super traditional background and I started teaching you know, <laughs> in 2009. So I do find, I do relate very strongly to a lot of the things that you were saying. And uh, we'll read in the book, uh, going through the chapters, I find it very interesting because it's what you describe in the book. It's more, um, I cannot define it. Is it more a process? a system, maybe an attitude, a set of skills that you think needs to be developed inside, how do you principles to be followed? It, it sort of seems to be all of them at the same time in yeah. a structured way that it actually helps. Where do you think is, you feel strongly? Is it more principles, skills? Process. Maybe you can, um, can both answer that question because I think on the one Absolutely. hand, it's, it's the personal development part, the leadership development, and, and Anamik is better equipped to talk about that. But on the other hand, and this is my strategy consultant background, you don't realize that, so then it's an approach because you don't realize that traditionally strategy is, you know, we analyze and then we look at the current and we improve. Well, if you're a designer, you do it differently. Yeah? You start with framing the question, but then you start with what could, what does good look like? Huh? You envision the future. So that kind of approach is very much a creative approach. And a lot of us don't even realize that we approach the eh? designers don't always realize that they approach things in a different way than let's say uh, business strategists do normally. So, so it is both an approach and an attitude and it's, look at the world as a designer means designing the process, designing the team, developing your own creativity. So it is all of the above. While I think a lot of people on the outside, if they hear the word creativity, they think either of artwork or they think of ideation, you know, coming up with ideas. That's, that's creative, but they don't understand that creativity is so much more than that. So this personal part, I think Anamika can talk much better about that. Yeah, and that's also, I think, one of the red lines in our book that we constantly shifting to link strategy and future thinking to what does it mean for you as a person? And what is quite interesting, a lot of creative people, well, since I was you know, uh, involved a lot of years with Design Academy Eindhoven, so I'm quite well aware of how creative makers learn uh, and that's a kind of you, you can say it's implicit learning or experimental learning. It's not through books, it's through making and iterations and see what works, see what the problem is, frame it, and then start a process without even knowing where you end. And that's a really strong thing in, in you connecting the dots while doing it or afterwards. And that's a completely different process than like Fenemik was explaining, like starting, this is it, we make an analysis, analysis, this is the process and there we go. And for a lot of people, they do not connect it immediately to creativity. They think, oh, that's a very fuzzy, chaotic way of working. Well, it's not. It's, it's if you ask designers, I'm not sure how many designers are in this group, they know how to do it, but it's sometimes really hard to structure it or afterwards saying, this is how I did it. So to realize that you need a different approach, but link it to, okay, so I need to have a different mindset and I really you know, have to start a process which I believe 
you know, where to go, meander to this process, like a learning journey. And that is what is totally creative. And, and I mean, 35% only is in our DNA and the rest is totally learnable. You can learn it. And that's completely different than, for instance, intelligence. But like Fenemik was saying, I mean, a lot of people think, oh, oh, you know, my, my, my daughter is really creative or, or, oh, we also have an artist in the family. I'm not sure if that is in Italy the same, but we constantly get those questions. So we thought it is important to get serious about creativity because a lot of people do not even realize that this is a potential and that they can apply it in work and not only after six or in the weekend, you know, to have this hobby. It's really something you can be good in. And, and, but you have to train it as a muscle. You know, it's not something, you know, it's not only the inspiration from outside. It's also really, you know, as soon as you realize you can learn it. And like you were saying, Elena, if you follow a kind of steps in our book, you can start to become better in it. And again, it's like a muscle. It's you train it, it becomes stronger and you realize, hey, I can use it in, in daily life. Absolutely. And uh, uh, that's one of the characteristics when, when, when you talk about it, and play, sort of the creativity, I would say that very often I see entrepreneurs that have that characteristics, that, that normally they get uh, surrounded by managers, nobody offended, no? but you do <laughs> have these sorts of very different approach. You know, entrepreneurs have this drive that sometimes takes them into uh, strange ideas and envisage the future in a very different way. That's the other part where I found it very, very interesting. When you ask, um, what is the balance though between what you define as very, as two extreme in a sense ways between the exploit system and the explorer system, no? So while reading part of your books, I sort of saw the difference between management styles and entrepreneurship, particularly at an early age stage, no? Um, uh, Fenemik, would you like to, to def no, sorry, Anne, would you like to define a bit more this difference between exploit and explore? This idea that is, that is probably the fundamentals of where you actually start moving uh, in terms of helping and supporting companies and managers and entrepreneurs uh, to shift the way of doing doing things in a normal way. I found it very interesting because it's only exploit and explore, no? So exploit gives us a bit of, I would say negative senses, but at the same time, it has to deal with the cost and the profits and something that sometimes we perceive as extremely necessary, no? How do you keep the balance or how, how you help teams shift Are you asking from me one or way me? to another? Because I missed a, a sentence. Oh, is up to you. I know Fenemig likes to talk a bit more about the future, but I know that you can both answer <laughs> equivalently. So, uh, Fenemig, I don't know, up to you. Yeah, okay, I will, I will answer from the start, yeah. yeah. Um, it is completely right that it's the, the challenge is to find the right balance between the exploit, huh? how can we make money out of it as well, and the explore, the coming up with the new ideas, the exploring the future. Uh, and entrepreneurs are very strong at that, but we both are also involved with uh, with scale ups, and you can also be too strong. Eh? You know, this is one of the challenges sometimes, and I see it in some of the family owned entrepreneurial companies as well. If you come up with new ideas all the time, and you you're not balanced by someone who also gives you a bit of uh, structure and uh, choosing priorities, and uh, let's make some of these ideas work as well then your company won't be successful either. So I think the challenge, as you say, is both in strategy to find the, the right balance between how can we keep innovating and develop new things and how can we also uh, cherish what we already have and really make the most out of it. And then what kind of team do we need with that balance? And that's where I'll hand over to my leadership uh, colleague. <laughs> <laughs> Point. Um, no, but that's it. In, 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 in every human, there is a kind of preference in, in how you approach things. And that's not only being, you know, on the exploit side or explore side, but you have a preference. Like if you have a question or you have things to solve, one start immediately with 100 ideas and the other one is saying, hold on, hold on. What are, what are we talking about? 
you need both. There's not, it's, there's not a judgment, there's not a value on that this one is better than that one. Well, it's really important for leaders that want to understand where you're good at, what is your preference? Is, are you the one who always want to look into the future and finding new ways to solve stuff? Or are you the one who first want to make, you know, the exploit side, get the basis, the fundament really structured uh, and well done? How is the financial situation of the organization? That's and both is fine. You need both. That, that is a very important thing. For leaders, you have leaders who can do both. You are kind of whole brain and who can, and we call it ambidexterity. And ambidexterity is using both hands, being left and right, right side at the same time. And you can swap quite easily. And if you have that spectrum, you, you recognize, you recognize, ah, we need now, we are now in the face of the business or the company that we need to become a little bit more innovative based on the structure we already have. But like Venomik was also saying, if you have too many people who every day come with new ideas or every week have this brilliant idea what you need to be done, then people who have the more exploit side are starting to get really nervous and really like, how can we, how can we structure this in the growing phases of the venture? And for leaders, that is a very important thing. One, to understand what your preference is. Maybe you're good in both, but everyone has slightly a preference. And two, who do you need in specific phase of the company, the growth phase of the company? Maybe you're aware of the, the Griner curve, you know, special curves in how scale-ups uh, grow. Building your team. So that's also that sometimes you need a slightly different team than another team. It's totally dependent on what kind of innovative you know, challenge there is. And, and you can learn. So you start to understand like, oh, you, I need you for this one. I need you for this one, because this one is maybe a little change process. And the other one is a really fundamental transform process. So it depends, it depends on, but it's a quite good model. We, we, we use it a lot in our consultant work because it, people understand it. People understand like, ah, ah, this is this is how it's 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 a kind of filter, a kind of lens to look at reality. Um, and for leaders and for strategy, that helps a lot. When we were preparing, I found very interesting a lot of when you both talk, no, about because it's it's very clear from an ideal point of view or from a theoretical point of view to say it. But then sometimes I was imagining both of you sitting in these rooms full of people that are either exploitative or explorers. And in a sort of way, you have to tell them uh, you're missing a bit or you have too much of that. Uh, how do you deal with normally? I mean, people that get into board of directors or other entrepreneurs have quite strong characters. How do you deal with them in, in, in a sort of way? And do you ever have any difficulties of one particularly explorer or one particular exploiter that you couldn't <laughs> convince they needed to activate the other side of the brain or they needed to start trusting the person that actually they find normally very challenging because they don't agree? Do you have any practical experience that you would like to share with us? Can you think of any of them? I think one of the first things to say is, uh, you say, you know, we tell them, uh, and actually we don't tell them. We try to make them conclude things themselves. So this is why we use sort of self-assessment tools, for example, for the team on this Exploit Explore. And if they map it, then they conclude, oh, our focus is really all there. And then you start to ask them questions. So it's more like a Socratic questioning, you know, what do you think about that? Does that fit the stage of the company you're in? Eh? Does it fit your strategy at the moment, et cetera? I think that is a very important, uh, if you tell people something, you know, often their first reaction is, oh, <laughs> so I think, and it's very difficult because I think the big challenge is, and that we've been there before as well, is that if they have a different self-image than how we perceive them, eh, then it becomes really difficult. That it was always yeah. thinking. <laughs> <laughs> and so, for example, uh, one of the companies we work with, they they are 
very entrepreneurial. It's a family owned company, very strong entrepreneurial family owned company. But they don't see that they're lacking on the executive side. And for example, their margins are really uh, squeezed the last few years. And as an excuse, they say, oh, but we are very, we're very much, we have the human values and, you know, this is ESG because we're doing this, this innovation on the human side. So we don't need to make that much money. And it's true. I mean, normally, I mean, I can't believe I'm saying that because normally we would actually say, don't focus only on uh, <laughs> making the money. But in this case, it's really like, how uh, sustainable is it? not to have enough margins over time eh? so but and and we cannot bring that message because that's clearly not our expertise i mean we we are all rounded but we're not those financial guys so then what we also do is we bring in other people who do other types of audits or who give another kind of uh, a mirror or and we really and then this is where the learning expertise of anamik really comes in because the trick is always what do we feel these people are like and how are they going to learn something? What do we need? Is Are they in their head and do we need to bring in experts, like cognitive experts, or are more people that are going to learn by doing or by maybe trying something and failing? Or how do we feel they're going to learn? And we're very optimistic and we always think that everybody can learn, but there's also people who don't have that sort of growth mindset and are just stuck and fixed. And then in the end, we have to give up. That's an honest answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, and the other thing is also, I mean, you guys are all in learning in a way, but it starts with the awareness. And, and so we, we try sometimes to almost mirror people in saying, but is it working? And, and if it's not working, what is the insight you have? So the awareness that... You know, you can do things in a different way. That's the key thing to start, not only to become curious, but also to start realizing, ah, what I always did doesn't work and there is probably another way in doing it. Well, that's that's a fundamental thing. And the other thing is that if we are invited in clients or in the boards we are in, people know that both Finamika and I, we see innovation as a learning journey. That's not something you can fix and, you know, cross the box and then it's done. It's a learning journey. You have to embrace it. You have to realize what the impact will be, what is needed. I mean, this is a process of learning. And that is maybe the most important thing to, to get in the mind of people. Like, do you realize that this is not a quick fix and that there is a collaborative way of learning, a collective way of learning to share, you know, how do we look at it? What are you good at? What, what are, what am I good at? So that is really a kind of cooperation in doing so. And to give you an example, um, what I really liked when we were at Domus a month ago um, is that combination of business and design in the companies, I am the chair of uh, um, uh, the supervisory board. The, this is really like you have this super creative founder of the company and on the other hand this let's say commercial sales business development kind of person and um that is that is a super interesting thing because then you i mean every week i realize like oh they they don't really have to lose each other they need each other they really have to find a way you know, to dance together and to understand each other and permanent one to learn together because it's not good or bad. It's not one side is better than the other, but they need to, to understand that they have to move together and to learn together um, because they will not change. You know, they, they can learn from each other, but they stay who they are because that's their strength. So it's also a matter of helping people to realize this is my superpower. This is where I'm really good at. And uh, it's not fixed. You know, I can I can enlarge it or, in you know, increase it to become better. But who do I need to make this journey really valuable and to create the impact we are striving for with this company? So that is, yeah, it's 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 a learning journey. It's really it's about a link between business and creativity, as you explained, but it's also, and I think that's implicit in everything we say, but 
It's also about a link between strategy development and leadership development. Because if you look at innovation, I mean, you talk about innovation, most people focus on innovation, let's say the output, what wonderful ideas come out of it, what wonderful new inventions we come up, et cetera. And we don't, oh, and there's a lot of, and we design that maybe yeah, with design thinking tools, but do we also design the team and the learning that is needed to actually make the innovation happen and to make it a success as well? If you look at all the research on tech innovations and also digital transformation in companies, the failure is almost always in the change management side. So to have the link between strategy and change management or strategy and learning, or let's say the business side and the people side, it needs to go hand in hand. And it seems so obvious, but in practice, we don't always see it because it's, I mean, HR directors are not always the most strategic people in the company either. So that I think is also a challenge because how do you merge those two perspectives? They need to be together. It takes me to one of the other pieces of your book that really got my attention, though, that is very rare to see. You say that in companies that in, are capable of innovating during time, they do this by creating communities to be able to innovate. So exactly as you were saying, you know, the idea that you need a community to be formed and they must share a sense of purpose. So we, we are seeing a total shift between the generation that I have older than others, we're all in a lot of senses in theory obsessed by the maximizing the profit into you are absolutely right the idea that there is a purpose what do we exist and a shared values uh, how do you approach this idea through the idea that one of the aspects you know of your i would say approach the idea that you have to care as well you have to care you have to take an importance about it before you actually start thinking about how do we do the future the caring part and the communities what you were talking about no is it essential can it be learned if i, I think oh may go on for me oh. uh, i'm sorry i was going to ask you another thing because one i think that i found very important i saw that is the idea of a fair process as well so that this whole caring purpose and fair to be there there is a, again, there is a company side and there is a personal side. And I think what we, what designers often are very good at is this, um, we call it the burning desire. And in, in change management, you often call, talk about a burning platform. You have to change because there you uh, there is a pain or you really, uh, the company's at the end of the life cycle. So you need to, or there's a big problem. And I think a lot of designers, what they bring is sort of a desire to, to change the world for the better. So to tap into this desire, that's where you need this common purpose and common value. So why are we working as a team? What do we want to achieve? And that's, and that's partly personal, but it's also the company purpose that people then need to align with, and because that's also what gives direction. I think... And the whole idea of strategy development has, of course, changed in the past few years. The faster you need to go, the more you need to have a sort of rough idea where you go and be able to adopt uh, to the to this rough direction uh, when possible. It's not the five-year plan anymore where you try to plan it out. So that's the sort of the caring about where do we want to go. And that means something for you on a personal level as well. When and how do you align with that? And that's again more anemic. And the the fair process, we will come back to that because I think that's more that's more a boardroom process as well. You want yeah. to say something about the personal uh, purpose and values, uh, anemic? Yeah, because coming back to what I started to talk of in the beginning, you know, this time, this century, with with so many complex issues and wicked issues um, it's it becomes more and more clear that people really feel that something needs to be done and it is also quite clear that we're shifting from this ego oriented phase in time to a more eco oriented phase in time that that it's not about you it's not about us it's not about this brilliant ego who 
you know, have fantastic ideas and can solve all the problems. It's not. And people who are intrinsic motivated in changing the world for the better, they more and more, you see it also in the investment world, for instance. This morning I had a conversation with an investor and, and that's an impact investor. And that's what you will see more and more in the next decade. Um, they only want to invest in companies where not only the founders, but also the culture of the companies is mission driven, very purpose driven. So they will only invest, put money in a company if that links, if that is clear and fair and transparent and that the future, you know, the future, uh, how they envision the future, that is super important. For on personal level, more and more, you see not only people of our age, but also the, the, the younger people, they have different values. They want to work for companies who, who do better. And it can be on circularity, sustainability. I'm a lot in the textile world. It's fascinating to see that they, it's not about having the car of the company. It's not having more salary. It's about, can I see the impact report? Can I really see if this is the company you know, I want to work for? And I want to put my energy and my, my capacity and my talent in. And, and, and a lot of people who have that, that is a strong compass for making decisions in life. And again, coming back to, if you then find the right company and the right, you know, with the right strategy and the right purpose, then it links to each other and then you get the best out of people. And again, it's, it's always about building this, let's say coalition of the willing or this community, which is one of the graphs in our book, one of the, the, the infographics in our book. Um, you need to do this together. You, need, you have a lot of expertise around it. You need a lot of expertise in making it happen. It's not easy eh, to, to change the world. It's not easy to make impact, but realizing that you want to find the right company, find the right people to do so, then it can be spectacular, but it's not easy. It's not the simplest way to do so. And I think there's a risk as well. Another common risk is that in talking about boards, uh, the, especially in more hierarchical uh, company cultures, you sometimes see the people in the top team going away for a few days to think up, you know, what is our purpose and what are our values, basically. And they're not always connected with why do people work for you or why in the company. So are you prepared to either bring in a lot of new people or are you uh, changing your company or what, you know, so... For example, a company we now, were, uh, it's a famous brand, so uh, we can talk about it. It's Kökenhof. It's, uh, it's the flower gardens in the Netherlands. It's, it's one of the main tourist attractions that attracts uh, one and a half million people. And the organization behind it, they're committed, which is very nice and very good. They're committed to, uh, to the transition of this industry uh, to make it more sustainable. That's, that's the corporate part and that's the people. But most of the people who work there on the floor, so to speak, whether it's the gardeners or the people, they work there to, to make the most beautiful flower garden. And so there's some people there that are really activists and really into in innovation and sustainability. But if you talk about their per personal purpose, they are they have a team purpose to get this garden out and as beautiful as possible, but it's a different purpose from let's say the corporate purpose that is about sustainability. So what we are now trying to do is to come up, what is the interpretation, interpretation of sustainability? How can we make this? Because it it's, sounds like a small thing, but if you don't have a clear purpose and direction, a common purpose and direction, then you also cannot judge the ideas that you come up with, you know, whether they, the innovations, do they fit the future of this business? Yes or no? What is your framework? You need to have a, a common framework, a common purpose and, and values and direction to say, Yes, we will do this. Huh? Thinking again about all these innovative entrepreneurial types that will come up with 100 ideas. Which one will you actually implement and which one won't you? You need, to, you need that shared purpose to, to decide. And other than the shared purpose, you have this uh, accent you know, on, on envisioning the future. Uh, I remember when I was thinking in my MBA approach, you know, the idea of 
the future that you have to do while you were you were sort of challenging and making me understand that envisioning is not defining the future to the one but try to imagine what are the skills or, or the approach that takes you there. Can you describe this envisioning a bit better? Because I think it is central and it's, for me, it was really a challenge in terms of understanding what you were trying to say in the book, the envision part, the future representation. Yeah, the, the, the good question, because most of our workshops or when we start a process, one of the key questions is, what does good look like? Mm. What does good look like? And like Fenomik was already sharing, for one person that is, oh, if I'm very happy and can go home at five o'clock, well, that is what work can look good look like. But if you and make this, you know, future oriented way of thinking uh, on a strategic level, then it's much more about is your company ready for the future? How does the future then look like? And and. So what we do, we collect, we work a lot with images. So we have this postcards and we just have this question, what does good look like for your company? And then people will pick a question and then they have all kinds of different associations, all kinds of different words. And it helps a lot because you pull them out daily life. You pull them out like, oh, I have things to solve. I have to write these emails. I have to call this important client. You pull them out daily life and you really start talking with different words and envisioning, okay, what are the key words? What are the images you think is really fitting? What, what, what you could be proud on in five years where your company is, is staying for or you know where, where, what the key values are. That helps a lot because a lot of people do not do this. And, and, and like you were saying, it's not about predicting the future. It's No, much- because obviously... Exactly. I immediately start in saying, well, in this changing world, how do, we, uh, how do I create scenarios for the future? And you sort of challenge that approach that comes into this very interesting one that is actually what is the one that you would like to create. You yeah. Know? And, and then coming back to uh, the way we approach it, but maybe Fenemy can add an, on that as well. We always think start with the end in mind because that gives direction to what you might do tomorrow so it's really building this process this learning journey and this innovation process with this let's say ideal future in mind and again if that is a shared future with all these images and words then you can pull out a kind of clear direction like oh, hold on this this is probably a scenario you all you know feel feel good with and 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 then you start with okay what can you do in short term what will happen on on long term and how can you then you know let's say design this future together that is a bit a, a bit the way we approach it but images using different words and your association everyone this is also a funny thing everyone can do this everyone we did it with banks we did it with corporate people, everyone will pick a postcard, you say, this is why I think this fits with my vision of the future. And that is completely different way of conversation and dialogues than you sitting around the table and have to start to talk about what are we doing today? But you're right, Elena, I think there's also some confusion about what does it mean, eh? designing the future, or the, uh, can we predict the future? And I think when you talk about scenarios, it's often because we don't know what will happen in the world. And, and again, I think we're in uncertain times with uh, with the war, with the economy, with everything. And then you can at least try to say what are the key trends and build scenarios on the what ifs. And that's something that Shell introduced. I mean, it's been introduced a long time ago from a governance perspective. Shell is one of the first businesses who started doing that already in the 70s. But I think that scenario development is not about you, it's about the outside world. What kind of different types of scenarios can we imagine? Uh, and then the, your own future vision is more about, and what kind of role do we see for ourselves eh? in those different worlds maybe? And sometimes it's the same role, no matter how the outside world is uh, changing. 
So it's a different type of exercise. I think both exercises are very valuable, especially if you're in a fast changing world. I think it's very valuable to also look at the external part and what are scenarios for that. But it's uh, it's always good to start with yourself because then you also get to know your own motivations again. Eh? What and it's it's what does good look like beyond uh, the money we need to be sustainable. And and this whole idea it sort of links in with the fact that you put the idea of act in the middle. No, so you have this. You you can foresee the future. You know who you are. But you have to do things in order to be able to learn. No. And that it, it, it's, it's, it's again, it's, it's an approach that actually tells you try, you can fail, it can happen. And particularly in a changing environment, like the one that we are living yeah. in now. Really, I think it's, it's the core of agility. I mean, this is where I say strategy development has changed. I mean, you can research forever. Uh, I think Amazon introduced this nice uh, concept of what kind of decisions do we make on having 90% of the knowledge and which kind of decisions we can only get 70% of the knowledge. I think so many decisions today are of the latter that you really, you can't know it all. So it's a threat to think too long. And this is how I was brought up huh? because I started out as a management consultant. So I was brought up to really dive into the data and to really understand and honestly, it's not the best approach anymore for many of today's issues. It's better to try out and adjust and keep on adjusting. And I think that's that's a pitfall of agility Some if you don't evaluate enough. <laughs> it's yeah. nice to have this idea of, oh, you know, we just do and we are. Yeah. But if yeah. the doing doesn't include also the evaluating and the adjusting, then the doing is not enough either. <laughs> so <there> is a <laughs> it's, a, it's a learning curve, I think, for all of us. How do we deal with this, uh, this, this changing world? Yeah. And in, in those terms, is there, um, in particular, you deal a lot because the, the thing is directed to the boardroom, but in reality, it's the whole company. Uh, I asked, you know, do you do you help them as well, or try to support them? Trying to use the language to uh, bring in uh, um, qualities or characteristics they are not there yet, or you rather try to help people transform themselves. How do you normally approach when you see that in the boardroom there is a part missing? Do you help them hire someone, or it, it starts already? because both Fenemik and I um, are invited to become or the chair of a board, supervisory board, yeah, or a member of the... And we only would say yes, if we understand that the company is in a kind of, you know, phase or, or you know, it is a kind of company who is focusing on, on innovation and on growth and on all these things. Can be all kinds of different companies. So as soon as we are in the boards, then already we bring a kind of you know perspective and mindset and innovation. And to be honest, if there's not room or the company is not ready for it, they probably will not invite us to do so because we can be really a pain in the ass because we approach things in a different way. We have we are constantly asking questions. So one thing is simply by having us in the board. Uh, already changing the dynamic on hold on shouldn't we have more time to discuss the strategy or shouldn't there be more time to dive into this specific topic so that is one side of it and the other side is sometimes we are invited to 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 look at current boards or existing boards um because they're stuck they are simply stuck in in this is how we always did it and it doesn't work anymore. Sometimes it can happen that a new C CEO is starting in the company. So executives, there is a change in the executive team and that immediately will affect what kind of people are in the supervisory board and, and is that still the right balance and the right mixture? Um, and yeah, well, so, so it's, it's actually also a constant learning process. And also there is sometimes a point that you have to say, we need other expertise. We need now, actually, I have it in one of my boards now that we definitely need a super expert, for instance, on textile and furniture. We do not have that expert yet. 
So that means we're going to search for a new member to do that in. So it's not a, it's expertise on domain. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, focus on much more on ESGs or SDGs, you know, that becomes more and more impo important. People understand how that works and impact measurement and all that stuff. Um, people like us who are really focusing on strategy and innovation, that is an important thing. Could also be another type of creative person, but the diversity, I think, is a really important thing to keep an eye on. Um, and you were is... asking, if I may add, because you were asking, do you find outsiders or do you uh, encourage people to develop this thinking themselves? Yeah. And when we do, because based on the book, we also do boardroom creativity evaluations. So we, we do this process with the companies. And when the conclusion is we don't have enough diversity and we our team should evolve, then the next question is how fast do you need it? Because yes, you can develop certain skills, but it goes slower yeah. than getting mm -hmm. in people. And there's also a limit to how much you need. So that's, I mean, it differs per company, but I would say... In general, it's nice and not to bring in one new person, but always think of two. I mean, to change something, you need a few more than just uh, one. So in general, I think it's a combination of bringing in new people and, and, and developing. In some cases, we've said, OK, you have time so you can really do a learning program on the one hand and set up like a challenger board on the other hand. So a subcommittee, an innovation committee, that's a way to do it as well. So the answer differs a little bit per company. But... Thank you very much, uh, Fabio. I think it's about time. We don't have any more time. It's We're already a, a, a bit longer, but it was very, very interesting. So thank you very much for this opportunity to listen to both of you. It's really um, changing. Oh, um, we can do that later. Thank you, Fabio. Do you want to close? Do you want to say something? Thank you for uh, Wanemek and Fenemek. And uh, I think it was wonderful. Like uh, our students will be, um, I think they, they all very inspired, inspired by what you said. And um, yeah, I think this conversation is something that is very open, of course, and we will continue, continue to push forward uh, this type of approach in Domus Academy, of course. And uh, thank you again for all of the, inspirational uh, and very practical also uh, advices and knowledge that you shared uh, today. It was a great pleasure. You're welcome. It was always yeah. nice to uh, go back to the Domus. Yeah. Yeah. We wait for you again. <laughs> yeah, always a reason to go to Milano. So, um, but thank you so much. Thank you for your questions, Elena. It was, it was fun. No, thank you. Thank you very much. It was really inspiring. Thanks a lot. Okay. Good luck, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.